Philipp Schlottmann. I'm an ethnologist, a photographer, and a visual anthropologist. And um, my, top, my, topic, my topic is Korean shamanism, Asian spirituality, uh, photography, and in general, Korea. So I've been living in Korea for around 12 years and uh, teaching there, but all the time I stayed uh, with shamans and researched shamanism, photographed a lot uh, about shamanism. So I've seen probably about 600, 700 <coughs> rituals in this time, but still I would say uh, it's very difficult to talk about the Korean shamanism because Korea is a very active shaman country and there are many different traditions. <coughs> so some of the rituals only take place every 10 years or every seven years. So it's quite difficult first to know the dates and to know when to go there, and then really to get the permission to go there and to photograph. It takes quite a while. So um, yeah, I would say uh, my main interest is Northern Korea shamanism. That's a shamanism that, that came in the 50s to South Korea. And um, why? because it's the most wild and ecstatic, and as a photographer, I enjoy this the most. So um, we talked already about the last lecture, about the definitions and what is shamanism. I think that we should start a very academic approach with the definition, and I take the shortest one. The shaman is the master of ecstasy. And I think, yeah, it's not big, and, uh, but it's good for a start. And shamanism is a technique of ecstasy. So. Um, if we take this as the definition of shamanism, uh, there are two points that are highlighted by Mirke Eliade. The first one is the altered state of consciousness, trance and ecstasy, and the second one is soul flight. And um, soul flight normally is experienced in two ways. Uh, that would be an alter ego, the, like an animal, uh, eagle normally, bear, deer, panther, tiger, something like this or really like a kind of soul mist, something that is moving to another world, to a transcendent world, to get answers and to get information for problem in the, in the world now. Um, it's not so easy to see, but this would be a, a bone carving from Alaska, where I think all the elements of this definition are inside. You see on the left side the shaman with the drum in, in, inducing trance moments, and you see maybe a client or a shaman himself uh, and the soul leaving the body still be bound with a kind of line. That's just for impression. And as we heard before, us, see, the ayahuasca vision, peyote, drug-induced soul flight that is typical for South America, but not at all for South Korea, where the use of drugs is punished and um, where alcohol plays a role, but it's not that important. It's mainly about drumming, how you, how you reach ecstasy and trance in Korean shamanism. So the question is, is soul flight really a criteria? And what about incorporation and spirit possession? When I photographed in Taos and, La Thai uh, La Laos and Thailand, there are a lot of uh, groups living at borders, refugees, and they all have shamans that uh, have their own traditions. And I see that um, soul flight is very often a combination of three aspects. So there is spirit possession, there is incorporation and soul flight at the same moment. So concentrating on soul flight as the main criteria is too weak and it doesn't fit Korean shamanism at all. Um, the se second one or second topic uh, is trance and ecstasy. We are talking about trance and ecstasy and especially last lecture also talking about these moments, but how do shamans experience trance and ecstasy? In Korea, they don't have a word for this. Trance and ecstasy have a different meaning. Ecstasy has to do with a sexual activity and alcohol drinking and making party. <coughs> and trance has a lot to do with a um, Buddhist, Taoist style of um, meditation. So the moment of ecstasy is the moment when you contact the spirit or the ancestor or the god. So there is no special feeling for ecstasy. It is the contact itself that they are talking about. So when we are talking about these definitions, 
I don't want to give you one. I think it's 25 minutes or 30 minutes. It's too short now to give definitions. But I want to point out why it is problematic. The first one is right, yeah. um, anthropologists approaching shamans will um, automatically change the situation. Um, the shaman is waiting, uh, has an idea what the researcher wants to see, he has an idea what he wants to ask, and a lot of interviews I have done two or three times, because they always talk about shaman illness and their, their trans experience, and they did this 10 times, 20 times with filmmakers, photographers. We live in the year 2018, they are not isolated, and Korea is a very modern country. So they say what you want to hear. And the second one is um, that we have expectations. Shamans should be wild, they should be a little bit holy, and they should be friendly, but they are not in Korea. They are pragmatic, it's a business. They are for sure, they have a spiritual connection, but they are normal human beings with normal friends, and they are not at all uh, priests or something like this. They are kind of businessmen, and they are living as shamans, and they have connection to the spiritual world, but they, they are not holy. The second one is, if I talk about shamanism, I automatically fix what is shamanism. But many shaman cultures are oral cultures, meaning if I live in Korea and I go to a mountain with three villages and I see one shaman and I write down what is authentic and traditional shamanism in Korea, I ignore two other shamans that probably live in the village beside and are a little bit different, but I will say in my book, this is the real one, and the next scientist will say, oh, this is not really shamanism in this village. It's not authentic what I read about shamanism. So writing about shamanism, working as an academic about shamanism always includes also to fix a certain idea, what is right, what is wrong. So um, that would be the second problem for a definition. And the third one is our perception. As I said, we have expectations, we have ideas how shamanism should be, and we see something and someone would say, okay, that's a beetle. Another one would say, this is a mask. A third one will tell me maybe a kind of landscape. And all these ideas uh, are right in a way, and if we observe rituals, especially ri spiritual moments, contact with another world, we have no measure, we have no idea how it is, we don't know how they experience it, so uh, it's very difficult to give a right answer and to say it's like this and he said it is like this. It's only possible if you experience it yourself, but as an observer it's, and, and even if you experience it yourself, it might be different between person A and person B. So. Um, I hope you can see a little bit. Uh, talking about Korean shamanism, what are we talking about? There are around 150,000 active shamans. If I mean active shamans, those are shamans who are doing rituals. There are maybe about 500,000 more who are doing fortune telling and small uh, part of rituals. Normally, uh, those shamans are not able to do the big ones, and because of this, they uh, reduce their work and become more fortune teller, do divination, stuff like this, amulets. Um, uh, okay, can you see something on this? This would be a North Korean shaman at the moment of uh, Chopshin, of this moment of spirit contact, meaning the shaman is calling the spirit and uh, experiencing the moment of incorporation. This would be a prayer situation is called Chilsong. In Korean shamanism, you don't have animal-like gods. Most of the gods are uh, anthropomorph or abstract like this one. This would be Ursa Major, the star constellation, and they pray for this star constellation. It's, quite, it's a quiet part of the ritual, very um, meditative. Uh, like in Korean shamanism, they divide between carnivore gods, like generals, warriors, and Buddhist-style gods that are vegetarian and a little bit, bit relaxed in their performance also. And if you observe rituals, they cover, for example, the meat when there is a Buddhist god and vice versa. Um, North Korean-style shamanism is very ecstatic and very wild, so you have a lot of um, blood, a lot of uh, dancing with knives, dancing on knives, cutting yourself. That's very typical for the North Korean style, not at all the Southern style. It's very different from this. This would be um, 
soul death ritual. It doesn't exist anymore as a real ritual, but it's very uh, splendid and very colorful, so it's on stage. It's a kind of traditional uh, or national treasure uh, that in Seoul is still presented uh, from year to year. The government is paying those shamans to keep the tradition alive. If, you, if we go down, down south now, we have uh, similar traditions like Seoul tradition, but it's a little bit more rural. You come in these areas now, it's not so golden and not so big altars, it's a little bit um, softer. Same situation, death ritual, shamans are dancing with the family around the table, but it's not anymore uh, as many musicians as before. Yeah. This would be a shaman of the center now, we're moving further south. This is a shamanism for villages and cities, it's normally a shaman shrine. And more or less every village has a shaman shrine and they do once or twice a year a kind of village ritual. And because villages are disappearing, they do it in the city now. But it's a tradition that is not as strong as it has been 10 years ago. This would be then a sitting ritual for photographs, a little bit boring, but if you are a linguist or someone who's interested in mythology, this is uh, the ritual to go because they uh, sing two, three hours strumming stories about gods and uh, Buddha and so on to, to describe the situation. What is difficult to see now is they have a kind of paper cutting in front of the altar that is a typical tradition that is disappearing nowadays. In 50 years ago, there was a blind man who was drumming and another shaman who was cutting. And they both work together, but nowadays the paintings are stamped in in Korea, you have shaman supermarkets. <laughs> so uh, they stamp this and they sell it finished. So it's not anymore a kind of tradition you can live on. So it is disappearing. It, it took me four years, three, four years to find someone who's still able because the ones that really do it, they are now 80, 90. And if you see the cuttings, they are, they are goodwill, but they are not the same like they did maybe for 20 years ago. So it was very difficult to find someone who was able to do this, but it's uh, a little bit uh, like you said before, in some areas it's very geometrical, in some areas it's very concrete, more like dragons or Buddha or some spirits. This would be an interesting ritual that is taking place every four or five years because Confu Confucian um, elements and shamanism mix what is normally not possible, but in, uh, shamanism ha has a lot of contradictions in Korea. Um, when I work at university, for example, I'm not allowed to publish about shamanism at one university because they think it's shameful for Korea that they still have this kind of Acharic religion. At the other university they think, oh yeah, super, very good, it's modern tradition of uh, Korea, we are still uh, having our old identity, so there are contradictions and it's difficult to handle a little bit. Would be the same ritual with a shaman dancing in the middle. Um, it's like in the daytime, you have this uh, Confucian style, very formal, and in the evening you have the shaman rituals. This is disappearing also it's in the south coast uh, East Sea. Those are rituals that are taking place in the villages on the islands, and they are very colorful also. A lot of uh, seafood, everybody is bringing his own cooking, kimchi in 10,000 variations. So it's a lot about food. It's a lot about mask dancing, uh, what doesn't exist in the other rituals, and is yeah, bringing the village together, criticizing um, older men. In a Confucian society, it's very difficult to criticize a man that is older than you. But in this ritual, everybody is allowed to, to a little, little bit like Carnival in Mainz or in Köln. You are allowed for this time to, to say what you want, and you are not punished for this. Um, but it's quite rare. Uh, it's more musicians, has more traditional instruments than the northern variations. Um, here we have the Sikkimkut. This would be a ritual that is a death ritual in the southern part of South Korea. These ones don't experience spirit possession. They uh, inherit their um, community and it's much more about dance and music than um, the northern part of South Korea. And this would be a totally different kind of shamanism. It's the island Jeju-do, 
when I talked about shamanism in South Korea, it's mainly women. It's around 80, 85 percent are women and the rest are male. There is a theory that those males are homosexual or transgender. I can't, um, I didn't see it like this. I think um, the male shamans nowadays are very often young men that didn't fit in society. It's like uh, 10 years only ago, every man find a job or um, women, women have babies and they stay in the kitchen and they do help the man to become successful. But nowadays, um, women are more successful in university. They start to marry a lot of foreigners and they are leaving South Korea. So a lot of men have problems to, to keep the status and um, to be better than the father. So I think a lot of males start to turn to traditional forms of identity and looking for a way to, to develop their spirituality or their, their place in this society. So um, yes, there are uh, sexual uh, differences in the males sometimes, but in general I would say the young shamans around 20, 25 nowadays are different than the ones probably 20 years ago. Um, the Jeju Do shaman is mainly fortune telling, uh, and he is in contradiction 80% male, 20% women. Has to do that in the, the island Jeju Do, maybe, maybe you saw sometimes in, in television, there are those diver women. So the ones with the money in these islands are the women. And so the situation changed on this island that um, male are doing the works of women, and um, women. Are more, more strong, more stronger. It is changing now because Jeju Do is bought by Chinese. More and more Chinese are buying the area because it's a little bit coastal, has beach, has a nice atmosphere. So 50% of the island is now Chinese, and with the Chinese, the, they bring money. And so the shamans of the mainland come to Jeju Do to find customers in Jeju Do of China because they pay very good, like customers in Japan, for example. There are many North Koreans in Japan and they have a better currency, or had a better currency. So shamans went to Japan, because the North Koreans look for a North Korean identity, and they paid a lot for shamans to come. Or they paid a shaman to take a video in South Korea, uh, in North Korean style, so that they can see their video of their ritual in Japan. Um, a short differentiation already now. We have like three types of shamans then. The first one would be the possessed shaman, the gangsenmu, that's the one that is experiencing a shaman illness like we, we heard already or we read about. Um, this will lead to a nerimgut, to an initiation ritual. And here it is important that they open the gate of words, that would be the expression. They are able to speak the real words of the gods. And um, it is said or it is seen as young shamans are very powerful and they're speaking a lot and intense, so many people come to this initiation ritual, but they are not experienced, so it's, a lot of the speaking is wrong. Meanwhile, all the shamans are not as strong, uh, they, don't, they don't have this strong contact anymore, but what they speak is seen as something more wise and more important. So the initiation ritual is very important. This Gongsu and Momju would be the name Korean shamans have thousands of gods and they have to look for their leading gods. And these momju are the leading gods for the shaman that could be of any kind, a warrior, uh, a prince, uh, whatever is possible, we will see a little bit later. The topic is broad, so I decided to concentrate on liminality or on the ritual, uh, liminal moments in ritual. And why did I do this? Because I think this is the most important part for me in the Korean sham shaman ritual. Um, Confucian society, and if you work once uh, in Korea, you will realize it's very tough. There is it's very clear, the structure. You don't show emotions. You don't discuss it. If your boss is telling you the world is flat, you will say, yes, it's flat, and finish. If you say, no, it's not flat, I had the situation that someone told me, I ah, don't talk about homosexuality and politics and our president, and I said, yeah, I will avoid, but maybe sometimes it will happen. He didn't talk two years with me. It's like he was really angry that I opposed his opinion, 
And uh, this is very common in Korea that you have to accept that the older people are wiser than you and that in the hierarchy you have to be quiet and live like this. So the shaman ritual now is a place where all this doesn't count. Women are free, you can say what you want, the spirits are in, in you, so uh, you can't be taken responsible for what you are saying. So it's a very important place for this situation. And why what is happening in the liminal, in, in the liminal moment is that you have a kind of chaos, an anti-structure. It's not anymore Confucian style. You have a potential for change because of this situation. Because always you look like one way, how can I find a solution for my business to become better? Why is my wife cheating me? Why, I don't, why do my children don't like me? And you look at it in one way. But if you have this situation, maybe the gods and spirit and ancestor will tell you something totally different. And you have a new perspective to approach the problem. And because of this, you experience a kind of new creativity for one, two, three hours. Rituals can take from two to three hours to three, four days, depending on the situation. And um, we have a typical concept of segregation, limity, and aggregation, meaning an old situation, then the liminal moment, and then you come to a new situation. And we talk about liminality. And there are like uh, three points that are important for liminality. I would say the first one is the presence of the god. You want to feel that the gods are here. You don't want to see something and take part in a ritual. And rituals in Korea are quite expensive. We are not talking, like I said before, about 200 euro. I do it for free. A little bit drumming, two hours, is 2,000 euro. And if you do a big ritual like a football opening or Olympic game or winter games, it's not officially, you don't see this in television, but they, they do it one week before, it's maybe 100,000, 150,000 euro. So um, you don't want to just hear about the gods, you want to feel them, you want to see them, you want to talk with them, you want to have the experience that you really have contact with the spiritual world. So the presence of God is very important. How do you feel this? How can you make the customer feel that he is really talking with God? Or the first one would be in the North Korean tradition, for example, as I said, they have a lot of gods. You have many pictures of gods that are all around the place. And so you can figure out sometimes with whom you want to talk or all these gods can in incorporate in 48 hours and you talk someone this way, someone this way or this way. A lot of the paraphernalia have pictures of gods that are used in special contexts, so um, you can choose a little bit in which direction you're moving. You have a special music. The North Korean one is very simple. A lot of drumming, very loud. The further you come south, the more elaborated and more fine the music is. In. So um, the music gives already a certain atmosphere to the ritual. You have, every god has a special dressing, so if the ritual room would be half the size of this room, all this wall would be dresses that the young shamans will give to the old ones because they can see by what they touch in the room which god will incorporate in the next moment. So they are permanently changing dresses or dressing several dresses. Sometimes the change can be ancestor of a family. It's like uh, five in 10 minutes and they're talking with them and telling, oh, I forget my letter. When I died, you should look in this uh, armor. I have my key of the car there, stuff like this. And then it's suddenly a god. So um, it's a very active ritual. You have a lot of things like cutting with knives in the traditions or dancing on li knives, like I said. And um, this shows that the shamans have certain powers, spiritual powers some people don't have. Dancing on knives, we know from other countries, but for example, something I saw is like, uh, Korean shamans have their own butchers, and they bring for um, rituals pork, chicken, cow. And uh, one time I saw that two butchers bring a cow, and the old woman uh, put up the whole cow in dancing with this cow, and it's deep frozen cow, so it's very difficult to handle. So you see sometimes stuff that is very strange, and um, this is what people like, or what people enjoy when they go there. And the second one would be, if you see this now and you have the contact to the gods or you're, you're sure that the gods are in the room, you want to have meaning in this chaos. You want to have an orientation. Why are they here and what do they tell me? And uh, the first one would be, they're choking with you. There is a, shamanism in Korea is a lot about sad situations and troubled situations, but also 
it's about charming talking with your un uncle, your aunt, and so you have a kind of coffee chat sometimes in between. Um, you get comfort. If you live in a society that is as strict as South Korea is, you don't cry. You don't, as I said, you don't show emotions outside. So it's very uncommon that someone will cry in public or someone will say that he is sad. You ask someone unhappy. Uh, you don't talk about your inner life and you never invite someone home. It's, everything is very structural and clear. So coming to a shaman ritual, having a woman incorporated by a man or whatever, talking to you and comforting you is already a big help for many people who are suffering, let's say, like half a year, didn't find a solution, couldn't talk to anyone, and then suddenly have someone who is friendly to them and uh, showing them a new way. And uh, for sure, the shaman is advising. Normally, if I, I, if I told you there are like uh, several days rituals, it's not one shaman only working. It's like four or five spiritual daughters. So one will comfort you, the other one will advise you. And you get advice from different perspectives. You have small kinds of fortune telling or divination, meanwhile, the ritual, in very short um, distances. So this one would be, for example, you burn a paper, and if the paper is flowing up, the ritual is OK. If it is going down, you have to pay more or to, to, to give more effort. <laughs> and um, the same would be here. And the bigger size this is, you, you bring this animal, like I said before, in that case, a pork pig. And a uh, pig would be a middle-sized society. You, you, you sacrifice chicken, you don't have a lot of money. You sacrifice pork as normal. A cow or several cows is really for rich people. I've seen one time someone sacrificing a lot of cows, and it's really like he wants to give his company to his son, but he had doubt. The son was a little bit hippie style, easy going, and the father was like, oh, I don't know if I should give him. And at the end, he didn't, because the shamans told him, no, wait one, two years. He is not really ready for it. And he made a big fuss about sacrificing to find the, really, the real answer. And what is difficult to see here, she's dancing on knives. And when they dance on knives, um, it's, the, it's the highlight for the ritual in, in Korean shamanism. They bless you. They throw rice, or they talk to you, give you last advice and will tell you everything will be fine, things will go. And uh, so you have the impression someone is um, helping you. And the last one would be, what can you experience? After you see this, experiencing would be, that is a scene called Mugan. You can join the shaman ritual from time to time, meaning you can dress uh, in the spirit you enjoy and you dance and have fun with the shamans for, let's say, one hour. And um, if you sit and listen and you have all these crying and sad situations, this is very helpful to, to just easy up and have a, a moment of relaxed fun. You experience this extreme form of suffering and crying and l lamenting of shamans that you can't see in another context. You experience moments of trance and incorporation especially important when you have a death ritual and you want to talk with the one that, is, uh, that died recently. Normally it's 49 days after the moment after someone died that you make the death ritual and it is seen, has to do with the concept of the soul, that only then the soul can move on. And so they have, in Korea there's a concept that Han, it's called Han, is uh, unhappiness, uh, sadness can live on. So you die, but Han is still existing. And it is going to your family and is disturbing your family and gives uh, unpleasant feelings and bad luck to this family. So they are looking for Han in these rituals and they want to find out what happened. Why did you cheat? Where is my money? So they really put up all these ugly and dark stories and we are talking really about suicide murder, cheating, second wife, children the father has with some other women and uh, he didn't pay for them. Or, so really the situation is that many families are quite surprised what, what the spirit is talking about and uh, things are imploding in that case and afterwards exploding. Um, you get presents. Shamans collect stuff from the altar and give you uh, food or fruits to bring home. It's also kind of good feeling for you to bring presents from the gods. Leads to the last point of this uh, short lecture, modern modernity and tradition. 
Um, Korean shamanism, as I said, is quite modern. South Korea is a very modern country and uh, in many ways more modern than Germany, for example. If I, come, I came back one year ago after these 12 years and I'm, I'm a little bit shocked about the internet situation in Germany, uh, <laughs> that you have to wait like six weeks in the, in the place in Korea where I live is the housekeeper has to take care. So if you come there, you have a right 24 hours later to have internet and if something is wrong with your computer, <laughs> Uh, you go to work and you tell your housekeeper, ah, tonight I come back, I have to work, uh, I need those programs, copyright is not a big topic in Korea, uh, please, uh, please install my computer and in the evening it's done. So when you come here and you, you hear someone telling you, yeah, uh, we come in three weeks and then they come and you are not there and they, or they didn't come and tell you you are not there, so it's quite different. Yeah? <laughs> so. Um, Tradition and modernity, what is disappearing at the moment? Um, this is a photo of, a, of an exorcism. Exorcism are called byonggut. So the idea of exorcism in, in Korean shamanism has very much to do with illness. Byong is ill, and good is the name for the ritual. So, um, but Korea has a very good medical system. They have very good hospitals. It's a kind of medicine tourism already in Korea that many people from America who can't afford the operations or who can't afford to wait anymore if they have cancer and they are told like next year we have operation, they come to Korea. Korea is very good, but you pay. It's like cash operation tomorrow. And um, so they, uh, this and you have Chinese medicine. So you have a big influence as strong as the Western medicine, Chinese medicine. So there is no really need of a shaman to look for illness. The only part that is taking care of the shaman is psychology problems because nobody wants to go to, to a psychotherapist or to, to a psychologist because as a man you have to go to army. If you have gone to a psychologist, you can't go to the army anymore. You didn't go to the army, you don't have success in life. Army is very important. So um, if, you, if you miss to go to the army, it's done. So if, you, if your son has problems, you go to a shaman because you first want to look if you can handle this like this. And the last step would be a psychologist where you go because you know it's a risk for the family. And um, this one, <laughs> yeah. also this one is a shaman covered up with a whale. And this would be the small pox, pox god. And uh, this one disappeared. Uh, this photo is around 12 years old, 14 years old. And smallpox are not a topic anymore. So uh, every year I saw less of this part of the ritual. And nowadays you don't see it anymore because smallpox is not a topic. Nobody gets this illness. And the cover here would be because of the scars that you have. And uh, beautiful skin is very important in Korea. So people would cover up if they have scars. Uh, this one is very interesting. As I said, there are thousands of gods, and this one would be Jean d'Arc, which is a contradiction in itself, that you have a Catholic uh, well, Christian becoming a god, but you meet, uh, well, what I saw is Mohammed, is, uh, someone was uh, incorporated by Mohammed, by MacArthur, the general that came to Incheon to free <laughs> South Korea from this war situation, and Jean d'Arc, and you have many, many more. But, um, you have a special painter then, it's a spiritual painter, you go to him and say, I have a dream about this and this, and he will figure out which god this is or which person it is, and he decided it's Jean d'Arc. <laughs> okay, performance on stage is another topic that shamans will go on stage nowadays and show a mixture of shamanism, music, uh, Korean traditional art. Sounds like a kind of yeah, degradation, or, um, but it is not. It's a modern approach to shamanism, maybe less spiritual, but Korea has a rich tradition um, and a uh, lot of interesting music, pansori, world cu cultural heritage, for example. So um, the mixture of shamanism and Korean tradition is excellent. It's very good to see. You have now several films about shamanism in the cinema. They are not as famous uh, in Germany or in Europe, but they are important in Asian countries because South Korea K-pop, this uh, Hallyu called style of pop music and so on made South Korea a very famous country for Thailand, Laos, China, all those uh, other Asian countries. So the films are quite successful in these countries and transport Korean shaman ideas to other countries. 
If you ever have the chance to see, I recommend the one in the middle, it's the most recent one, and he uses digital technique to find a way to, um, to show trans moments and mystic moments, and it's, it's not kitsch, it's well done, I think. The other side is um, that the government wants to keep Korean shamanism as a root of tradition, so they want shaman performances on stage without spirituality. They just want the music and the dance and the dresses and they don't want that they do uh, fortune telling divination or something like this. So you have a kind of shaman performances except the spirituality. That's actually not new. The stu student protests in Korea in the 70s against the military dictatorship, they decided to do it in a shaman way because they know that the old officers and generals in South Korea will hate that they do shaman performances, so they decided to do shaman, shaman performances without spiritual context on the streets to provocate the government. And this will be the last, last picture. Uh, beside all these changes and the question about flexibility and modernity in Korea, if you uh, research Korean shamanism, it is still similar to all times. There are not many um, written texts about it, but if you see, if you go to the beaches or to the mountains where young shamans are searching for their ghosts or preparing for initiation rituals, it is not very different from texts you see of Japanese colonial times where they describe what they have observed when they were in Korea. So there is a modern, time, modern type of Korean shamanism and it's a very active and not disappearing at all. But a lot of this is rooted in old traditions that are fixed, even so not written down, but uh, transported by the older shaman. That's it. <laughs>